day to be here to worship with you. My name is Lee. I'm the college pastor uh, here at Cornerstone. It's my privilege to work alongside our college age peoples, and it is an incredibly exciting time uh, just in the life of the church. And uh, I'm honored to be here with you this morning to be able to teach and share with you. And so, um, thank you for having me here and in this place. Uh, if you were at the 9:30 on Easter Sunday, congratulations. You successfully ran off about 150 people. Um, this service last week had people crawling out the doors um, and up the rafters, and Scott had people in the booth with him, and he was weird about that. It was, it was a lot of fun, but there were a lot of people. So welcome back if today is your second time. Uh, if today is your first time worshiping with us at Cornerstone, let me say welcome as well. We're so very glad to have you. Throughout our Easter season, leading up to Easter, is a season called Lent. It's just this season of preparation that comes with knowing that Christ is going to be crucified on Good Friday, but that he will also rise again from the dead on Easter Sunday. And the church for thousands of years has celebrated that season known as Lent of preparation. And so we did that simply by working through Christ's last week on earth. And so we spent a lot of time in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, looking at all of the events that took place uh, in that final week of Jesus' life. But previous to that, Starting in January of this year, we started our study and our journey through Hebrews chapter 11, the book of Hebrews, which is close to the end of your Bible, um, if, which, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. So you can stop by at the information desk uh, on your way out and snag one of those, or you can get up right now and go get one. It won't bother me at all. Um, but we've been working through Hebrews chapter 11, looking at these, what we've called stories of faith, and we've titled our series of this study just by faith of living by faith, of doing all that we do, looking at these stories of these people who lived all of their lives wrapped around the idea that faith in God was the only thing that got them to the place that they wanted to be and that continued to push them to the place that God wanted them to be. Josh Agerton, our Lee Scott site pastor, talks often of Hebrews chapter 11, and he even wrote this in his Bible out to next to the section where it says, by faith in most of our translations, he wrote, stories that matter. Not necessarily that the people in and of themselves are more important than other people throughout history, but the stories that matter because this was a group, a, a family, a nation of people that lived by faith and their stories of remembering and trusting in the Lord's faithfulness and goodness, they are worth remembering. So for us, thousands of years later, they are stories that matter not only to their lives and their context, but they are also stories that matter to us. And so as we learn to live by faith, as we learn to do all that we do because of the faith that the Lord has given us, uh, we are using their stories and their examples as encouragement, as instruction, as teaching and correction. So we are continuing on in that now that we're on this side of Easter. Obviously, we're looking at it through the lens of the cross because we worship on this side of Easter Sunday. And so um, it, we are to a part, though, uh, of Hebrews chapter 11 where the stories start going really quickly. And so that's where we're going to jump in this morning in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 20. The writer says, By faith, Isaac invoked future blessing on Jacob and Esau. So up until this point in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer has given us a little bit of context or maybe just some specific teaching in Hebrews itself. But now as he starts picking up speed a little bit, each verse or each story is just kind of a glimpse that we get. And we have to remember that the writer of Hebrews would have assumed that they were Hebrews or that they were Jewish Christians who had come to faith in Christ, that they would have understood exactly what was meant when he wrote, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. For us, thousands of years later, we need a little bit of context and a little bit of story. Um, and that will be the case for, for us as we continue forward in our study of Hebrews chapter 11 in the weeks and months to come. And so while in the past we've spent a lot of time in Hebrews, and from here forward, we're going to have to spend more time in the original story. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to work through 10 chapters of Genesis, and we're going to go through every single word, and we'll leave at 6 p.m. tonight. We're not going to do that. Because uh, when the 11 o'clock shows up, they'll wonder what's going on, and we'll say, find a seat if you can't. No, we're going to hit some highlights, and we're going to work through all 10 chapters, but kind of skimming and landing in places. A little backstory before we do, though. God promised to Abraham... I will give you a son. And not only will I give you a son, but I will give you a land to inhabit. So Abraham and Sarah, they leave 
their father's or his father's family and all of the things that he had known and all of his security. And he goes to this promised land, and God says, I will give you a son, and Jacob, or, and then um, Abraham and Sarah are both like, I don't really know what that means. They take matters into their own hands. It doesn't go well. God does come through faithfully on his promise, and they have Isaac. So they have the son, they have the land, and then there's this promise that they will become a great nation. And the, the, the whole premise of this blessing, the whole premise of this promise that God made to Israel and giving them this promised son that would become a promised family in this promised land was so that they, as the people of God, could be the blessing to the entire world that God intended them to be. I have blessed you to be a blessing, God tells Abraham. Isaac is born as the promised son. He has two sons, Jacob and Esau, um, and they are very much, um, from the very beginning, at odds with one another. We're going to look through this story of the dynamics that happen um, so let's do that. Let's go ahead and jump over to Hebrews chapter, or Genesis chapter 25. Not all of this is going to be on the screen. And again, like I said, I'm not going to read all of this. But we're going to have to work through the story together to get to the point that I believe that the, Hebrew of, of chapter, the writer of Hebrews chapter 11 is trying to make for us. So in chapter 25, um, Isaac and his wife uh, conceive miraculously. They, just like their parents, could not conceive at first. They have um, these two twin sons that are born. The first one comes out, and he's red, and he's hairy, so they name him Red and Harry, which we read as Esau, which is just how they named people in that day. Then Jacob, his twin brother, comes out, and he is literally clutching the heel of his younger brother, or older brother as the younger brother, technically, at this point, because he comes out second. So they name him Heel Clutcher, which more literally in Hebrew is Yaakob, which means deceiver, schemer, or liar. This this, this name that he has given, that his, that his mother gives him, will play out big time in his life. So these two brothers come out. They've been struggling in the womb. They come out literally fighting. And so they get to this place, and, and, and they come out, and uh, they grow up in such a way that almost immediately you see this family division that starts to take place. Esau is loved by his father because Esau learns to hunt and fish and do all these things and work the land and he smells like he's been working outside. You know what I'm talking about when you smell like you've been working outside. So he smells like that all the time because showers weren't a big thing then. So he is named and he is loved by his father, this red, hairy, manly man. And then his younger brother, the scripture says, that he lived among the tents, that he dwelled among the tents, meaning he's a mama's boy and he stayed at home all the time and he was loved by his mother. So we have these two sons and these two parents that are immediately divided with one loving the younger and the father loving the older. And so we find that this, they, they're in this place in Scripture in chapter 25 of Genesis where Esau goes out and he hunts, which is what he always did, and he comes back with this game. And his father just learned to really love as he grew up and as he got older. He loved the way that he prepared the meal for his father that he had killed. So Isaac, or so Jake, so uh, too many names, Esau goes out hunting, comes back, He's killed, and he's done exactly what he had planned on doing, but he comes back, and he's, he's really hungry. And so his younger brother, Jacob, is there preparing this bean soup, this lentil soup. And he tells him, I am famished. Would you give me some of your soup? And Jacob, being the heel clutcher, the deceiver that he is, says, I will give you some of my soup if you sell me your birthright. Meaning, as the oldest son in this family, you are promised far more of the inheritance and far more of our father's possessions than I am. So if you'll give me all of that, it's yours. And so immediately Esau's appetite controls him and overcomes him, and he immediately takes his bowl of soup and says, you can have whatever you want that is mine. And so Jacob says, good deal. And he gives him this bowl of soup, and now all of a sudden, all that was promised to Esau is now gone, and Jacob now owns it. And you have this just incredible rift that's continuing to grow between these two brothers. This appetite that has overcome Esau leads him to a place of losing this birthright. And in Genesis 26, I'm carrying on with the story, there's this famine, and the immediate temptation is to run to Egypt. Egypt had all of the resources, and God says, no, Isaac, stay here with your family. I will provide for you. And then we move on into Genesis chapter 27, and there is just this continued rift that continues to grow among these two brothers, and they've continued to be provided for by the Lord. And in Genesis chapter 27, starting in verse 1, Moses records this. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son, and he said to him, My son, and he answered to him, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. 
Now then, take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. The pollen has not been friendly to my throat. So there's this promise, there's this, this command to go and hunt and kill and bring back, and he says, I will bless you before I die. I don't know the day of my death, but I will bless you before, that I, before the day I die. And his wife, Isaac's wife, overhears this, and so she goes and tells her younger son, whom she loves, hey, your brother's out hunting, your father's getting ready to give him the blessing. You've already stolen the birthright from him. Great job, by the way, I don't know how you did that. But now he's on his deathbed, and he wants to invoke this final blessing this final live long and be blessed by the Lord. Here are all the things that I want you to do as the head of the family, all of these sort of things. He's out hunting and he's going to receive that. Let's dress you up as Esau, put his clothes on you, and we'll go in with a bowl of stew that we know that he loves because he tells us all the time that he loves Esau's cooking. And you'll go in and convince him that you're Esau and steal not only the birthright but the blessing as well. And so Jacob's like, yes, this is a great plan. And so they do that. And I don't know how blind or how old you have to be for this to work, but it works. And Jacob goes in and convinces his father that he is, in fact, Esau. And when I think of this story, when I look at this family drama that has taken place, I look at my own family and I'm like, okay, my family is not like this. We are doing okay. Things are not as bad as they could be because this family has way too much drama going on that's safe for anyone. And they are continually manipulating and working against one another. They've co chosen two completely different sides. They would make a great Jerry Springer story. And they show up, or it, Jacob shows up in the tent disguised as Esau. And so when we read a, further on in Genesis chapter 27, he's convinced his father with his smell, with his feel of his clothing, and with the food that he's provided that this is, in fact, his oldest son. And it says this in 27 verse 26. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who who blesses you. Immediately, Moses records that Esau comes back from hunting. Jacob has successfully stolen inheritance, and he's successfully stolen the only thing that he has left in this final blessing of prosperity and a future and hope that comes from his father. And he has royally ticked off. And so it, Scripture records that Esau is conniving and plotting and manipulating that as soon as his father's mourning is over, I am going to kill my brother. And like all good protective mothers do, Rebecca hears of this as well. And so she tells Jacob, hey, your brother is plotting to kill you. What we did was pretty bad. Um, you're going to want to leave. And so she tells him, go and live with my relatives in a distant land. And so Jacob immediately flees and leaves Esau as he hears that his brother is planning to murder him. So we go into the next chapter of Jacob's life. He's fled his brother and he's left his mother. He's left everything he really knows and he goes and he lives with this guy named Laban and he sees one of Laban's daughters who is incredibly beautiful and he says, I want to marry her. And so he tells Laban, hey, will you give me your daughter Rachel in marriage? And he says, you can marry my daughter if you work for me seven years. And so Jacob says, that's no big deal. I can handle that. She's amazing. And so he works seven years only to be deceived by his would-be father-in-law and he gets to the day of their wedding and he finds out that in their custom in Laban's country that you have to marry the oldest daughter first. And so there is another daughter, Leah, who is not as attractive as Rachel is to Jacob, who is not as lovely, and he marries her because Laban then goes on and says, if you work another seven years for me, then you can marry Rachel. Fourteen years go by, Jacob has been manipulated and deceived for years and years and years at this time by his father-in-law. He has finally married both of these women. He has sons and daughters by both of them. But at the end of his story with Laban, he starts to catch wind that Laban and Laban's sons specifically aren't real fond of what he's been doing among them. And so we read in Genesis 31, Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all of his wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. 
So then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land your father, to the land of your fathers, and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So if you're Jacob, you hear the Lord tell you, Leave all that you've known, leave this land where you've found your wives and where you've had all your children, and go back to the land of your father. And if you're Jacob, you're going, No, Esau's there. There is no way I can go back and face him. But what we start to see is this shift in Jacob that's taken place over this decade and a half of his absence that all of a sudden he realizes what God is starting to do and he starts praying to God in a different way. And if you read Genesis 25 through 35, you see this progression of this young, foolish man who's deceiving and manipulating and lying and conniving. And he gets to this place as the Lord is prepared to lead him back to the land of his fathers. He gets to this place where he recognizes that God is all that he has left. That God is the only one that he can trust at this point. And yes, he is deathly afraid, but he trusts in this moment that God will do what he says he will do, that he will be with him and that he will go before him as he returns to his brother. So he's on his way back and he's praying and he's asking for the Lord to soften Esau, to make this go okay, to bring reconciliation. And he gets to the day before he's going to go ahead and meet Esau. And he sends, which I think is, is ridiculous, he sends his whole family ahead thinking, okay, if, they, if he doesn't kill them, then maybe he won't be so bad on me or hard on me. So he sends his whole family, which is in reality God's sovereign way of keeping Jacob in the wilderness completely alone and isolated. And we have this famous moment in Scripture where Jacob wrestles with this, what he thinks is a man, which turns out to be God. And he's wrestling with him, and he's wrestling with him, and he's wrestling with him, and he says, I will not let go of you until you bless me. And the Lord touches him on the hip. So if there's never a moment that Jacob thinks this is God, it's in this moment where he touches him on the hip and throws his hip out of socket. And Jacob walked with a limp, with a hip that was out of socket for the rest of his life. In that moment, he tells him, listen, for all of your life, you have been Jacob, liar, deceiver, manipulator, cheat, thief, heel clutcher. For all of your life, this has been who you are, but I am giving you a new name. He's welcomed home by Esau the next day. God's obviously done some incredible work in Esau's life. Because when he sees Jacob, he embraces him and he wraps his arms around him and he kisses him and he welcomes him home and the brothers are reconciled to one another. And as Jacob is moving back into the land of his family, he remembers a promise that he made to God in this specific place where he told God, listen, if you'll do all that you say you'll do, all that you've said that you would do from my grandfather Abraham to my father Isaac down to me and through my family, if you will do all of that, I will serve you and worship you with all of my life. But it took Jacob almost two decades to get to a place where he was ready to respond and say, now I will do my part of this covenant. God had been shaping and working and molding and kind of cutting out all of this old Yaakob from Jacob. It was bringing him to a place where he would give him a new name. And when we read in Genesis chapter 35, starting in verse 9, it says, God appeared to Jacob again. When he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob. But Israel shall be your name. And so he called him Israel. Israel means one who strives with God. One who eagerly seeks out. One who earnestly pursues. One who wrestles with God. One who is constantly moving towards God. This is who you were, Jacob. But because of this encounter with me, this is your new identity. So much so, this is your new name. For all of your life, you have been a deceiver and a heel clutcher. From the moment you came out, and your mother even cursed you with a name that reminded you of it, over and over and over again, you've heard this said of you. Today I am giving you a new name. It is no longer true of you that this is who you are. I'm giving you a name that is loved by me. For all of your life you've been stealing. Now I am going to give you far more than you can possibly imagine. And I'm going to give you so many blessings and so much life, none of which you deserve. Jacob, I am giving you a new identity. God's promise to Abraham was very simple. If you go and do what I'm commanding you to do, I will give you a son. That son will become a family. That family will become 
a nation, and you will prosper in a land that will blow your mind. God's promise was then fulfilled first in part by Isaac and the promised son that came. Isaac has two sons, and the fulfilled promise continues down the line to Jacob. It continues to move on and move on and move on, and what Israel quickly forgets, what Jacob and Esau quickly forgot, was that the blessings that they had received were meant to be a conduit of blessings for everyone around them. It's something that I do believe that, as the writer of Hebrews says, that is that something that Isaac fully understood, is that my life is really not about my life. My life is really about what God has done, what God has promised, and how he's using me and my family to carry out the most amazing truth that the world has ever known, that there is a God who has a plan and a hope and a future for you, and that he absolutely loves you. By faith, Isaac blesses both of his sons. And I am firmly convinced that it is only because of faith that Isaac blesses his sons. Because when I look at the soap opera that is their life, and all of the things that went on, and all of the lies and deceptions, there's no way Isaac blesses his sons because he looked on it and said, they deserve this. I truly believe that in his last days, Isaac knew that God was going to do what only God could do through his family, and he prays a blessing over both of his sons at the end of his life. Esau, in fact, receives a blessing as well, even though he's given up, forfeited his opportunity to receive the blessing of the firstborn. But amazingly enough, in God's faithfulness, he is completely blessed, and he actually becomes a nation as well. And they actually have, Esau has 12 sons, and those 12 sons become 12 tribes, and those 12 tribes become a very large nation. And it parallels so much of what God is doing through Jacob and through his family that would become the 12 tribes of Israel. God continues to be faithful even in the midst of a story that is royally messed up because of the actions and the decisions of these sons. The beauty of the kingdom of God as we read this story, as we read the story as believers in a resurrected, reigning Christ, The beauty of his kingdom is that Jesus did not come to fulfill this promise. Jesus did not come to fulfill this promise to hang on a tree and die for those of us who are perfect. That Jesus did not endure the shame of the cross for those who are completely put together. Jesus did not rise from the grave and defeat death because it could not hold him, and then send his spirit to live inside of all who would believe from that point forward for those who are already self-righteous. God has done all that he has done. God has accomplished all that he has accomplished in and through incredibly broken people for all of history. And Jacob and Esau are no different. From the beginning, the promise of God is this. I have a plan I have a future, I have a hope that will blow your mind if you will just come and love me. If you will be my people, I will be your God. I will go before you and with you. I have come to rescue you because you are not capable of keeping the agreement that we made. God meets Jacob in the wilderness, gives him a new identity that Jacob had spent years trying to manipulate on his own. This place of final achievement and status and moving up into the right and taking and deceiving and conniving and manipulating, all of it was empty. And God gives him this new identity. And the beauty of the cross is that everything that happened before then that looks to and points to Christ is redeemed on that cross. Meaning all of Jacob's manipulating is made whole because of what Jesus finally accomplishes as the fulfillment of the promise of God. And for all of us who come after, the beauty is that when we look at the cross, that the day we are saved, and from that day forevermore, we serve a risen and reigning Christ who saves and who loves and who rescues when we are in most need of being rescued and given a new identity. The good news for all of us who believe in Easter, for all of us who believe that Jesus is sitting where he says he is sitting, that he will do in the future all that he says he will do, and that he will continue to restore us and make us whole now that we have given him our entire lives. The 
promise is good. The promise is true. The promise is something that we as believers can bank on. And I am convinced that there is no amount of hurt, that there is no amount of pain, that there is no amount of brokenness that Jesus looks at and says, no, that's too dirty. That's too fragmented. That's too messed up. That's too backstabbing. That's too manipulative. That's too anything. I don't believe there's anything that Jesus looks at according to what we know about Scripture and what I know about what he's done in my own life. There is no amount of brokenness that he cannot make whole. There is no amount of uncleanness that Jesus cannot make clean. And there is no amount of pain and hurt that Jesus cannot heal. The resurrected Christ that we serve will always no matter what, no matter our failings, no matter our brokenness, a resurrected Christ and his Father and by the power of their Spirit will always bring his plan, his promise to completion in us. I tell students on an almost weekly basis, there's no way you can screw up God's plan for your life. Because if you believe that you can, then you believe in a small God. But if I believe that Jesus takes my mess and he makes it beautiful and that when I recognize that and I keep my eyes set on the cross and I spend all of my days living by faith that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do and that if he can take Jacob and make a nation out of him that will then bring about the Christ so that I can know hope in life, if he can use Jacob in that, he can do all that he says he will do in my life. That there is nothing inside of me that he kind of backs away from, but that he is daily, every single moment of my life, making me look more and more and more and more like himself. And then I believe that the truth of Scripture is this, that once we know that, once we own that, once we live with that, and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and we live like we know that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, then the only response is to live all of our lives in every moment of every day as a blessing to other people. At some point, those who follow Christ have to realize that this life isn't about us. Israel had to get to a point, Jacob had to get to a point where he was ready to be Israel and God was doing all of that in him and he lands at this place where he's wrestling with him, where he's given a new identity and God says, blessed to be a blessing. Given all that you will be given so that the world can know me because that's the promise, right? The promise is that for those who know Christ, for those who confess that he is Lord and Savior, the promise is that we can know God and be known by him. And we live by faith for the rest of our life until our faith is our eyes. We live all of our days by faith that God has done what he says he has done and that God will continue to do what he says that he will do. And that he gives us a new identity, a new creation inside of us so that we can go into this life outside of these walls where we have come together to worship him this morning, we can take that truth to every single person in our life that doesn't know it, that doesn't know love, that doesn't know wholeness, that doesn't know restoration, because we do. Amen? All right, let's pray together. Jesus, we confess that we are often Jacob. And then when we look at the story of Israel, we are often quick to look at them and go, man, how could you guys do this? But the reality is, Lord, I find myself so often being Jacob. And there are other days where I find myself being Esau, where my appetites control all of my decisions and all of my actions and all of my direction throughout the course of a day or a week. But the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the story of God is you are a father that blesses your sons as Isaac did his you are a God who blesses your sons and daughters regardless. That you choose to set your love on people who are not worthy of it. You didn't die, Jesus, because we were lovely. You died to make us lovely. 
We confess, Lord, that we are often quick to forget that. We are very quick to go back to our old name and our old ways. And so, Father, today we confess that we need your spirit and your power to be in us and working through us as we go from here today because if it were up to us, even as those who profess faith, if it were up to us that we would be a people who continue to profess ourselves to the world, but because of your spirit in us, we are a people who profess Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ reigning over and above, and Christ who longs to come and heal who is making all things new. We thank you that you call us to live a life of faith and you give us all the things that we need. You give us all of the tools in your spirit and you give us stories like this of Isaac blessing his sons by faith, believing that you would do what you said you would do and that you would accomplish what you said you would accomplish through his family. And we believe the same is true of us today, Lord. We love you very, very much. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen.